Everyone, please welcome VP of Customer Experience, Slack, Allie Rail. Happy Frontiers. Um, that's me, so I'm in the right place. And I think that you're all here for incident management, so you are too. Um, I'm the VP of Customer Experience here at Slack. I'm really glad to be here with you today, and I'm like really grateful that you're taking time to spend your day with us. Uh, what I do at Slack is I lead a global team. Um, our job is to, to deliver the best possible experience to our customers. And this means that we're often working really quickly in high-pressure situations. When incidents happen, they do happen. Um, our team is on the front line, and we're responding to customers, triaging tickets, and working fast to minimize the impact to all of you, our customers. So today, we are going to discuss how Slack can help you manage incidents, because incidents do happen to everyone. No matter what industry you're in, no matter what business you're in, they're inevitable, and they're just part of what we do. So, not only are they inevitable, they're super costly. Um, Amazon, for example, lost about $100 million for one hour of downtime on Prime Day. Facebook, they lose about $6.5 million for an hour of downtime. And Delta, for a recent outage, they think they lost about $150 million for five hours. So, the cost is going to vary for your business. Obviously, most of us are not operating at this scale, but the cost of incidents are going to be huge no matter how big you are. So, how are we going to solve this? Ultimately, it's people. People solve incidents, but we can't do it alone. Um, we all need to coordinate across an evolving set of apps, data, and information in order to get ourselves through an incident to a positive resolution. Slack can speed up that time to resolution by bringing the right people, information, and apps together in one place. And this means that the right information is at the fingertips of everyone who needs it. This is what we're going to show you today. So, um, you can use Slack's native features and the ecosystem of Slack apps to improve your incident management process. Here are a few tips. The first one, assemble. Um, create some channels for incidents to assemble the right people together in one focus space. Integrate. Add monitoring and alerting integrations to Slack. This will allow you to be better informed of the health of your operations right where you already are, which is a channel in Slack. And finally, analysis. After an incident is over, you can actually use your channel history to learn what you uh, went through during the incident and apply that to future incidents that you have. So, this is a good place to start, but every customer and every incident is going to be unique. So, let's dive in. Um, today, fortunately for you, we're going to hear from three incident management experts. And they're all each using Slack to reduce time to resolution in some really innovative ways. First up, we're going to hear from Rachel Opsler. She's VP of Product at PagerDuty. Um, hands up, do you use PagerDuty? Yeah, look at that, Rachel. <laughs> Uh, she's going to share some of their hard-won lessons that inform the development of PagerDuty's Slack app. Um, next up, we have John Soini. He's a product manager at T-Mobile. He's going to share the lessons that he's learned having built a robust set of custom applications for T-Mobile's incident management workflow. And finally, we know that incidents span every industry, so we're going to bring up Dan Bruce, a paramedic, and he's going to show us how he uses Slack to triage medical emergencies. But first, it's Rachel and John. Come on up. All right, welcome. Thanks, Sally. Yeah, Rachel, we're going to start with you. Tell us about yourself. So I am Rachel Opsler. I've been at PagerDuty running the product team for about two and a half years now. And um, for those of you not familiar with PagerDuty, we help companies manage their digital ops. So all of those great products and services that your customers expect to be always available 24 by 7, we help you keep it that way. All right, so um, tell us a little bit more about incident response. Yeah, so, um, so PagerDuty is both a... Um, a partner and a customer of Slack. Um, and so I want to dive into what that looks like. But before even doing that, I wanted to talk a bit about incident response in general. And um, uh, not like maybe other traditional ways that you do things, 
Um, incident response is a, is a very different way of working. So uh, for a number of reasons. Obviously, when something is going on, when your customers are burning, you need to do things in real time. And so what that means is a couple things. One is that you don't have the time to um, send a question up the ranks and wait for someone to respond. Um, you have no time to, to do something like that. So traditional to command and control just doesn't work. Um, the other thing is that you probably don't want um, a whole bunch of VPs or people that, that um, don't really know how to solve a problem on a bridge or on a Slack channel giving unhelpful questions and asking things like, when is this going to be done? Because that just takes away from the people who are, are actually trying to solve the problem. Um, and so, and the other thing is that um, no matter how smart that VP is, probably the best person to solve an incident is the person who last touched the code or the person who solved the last incident. So those are the people that you really want to give dedicated time to. They need to be able to work with each other in a collaborative way um, and solve the problem. So um, if we go to the... I just I'll realized I this. should have given you the power. Yes. I'm sorry. I'll take the power. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so if we see what that looks like, um, so first of all, you want to make sure um, that with, with uh, real-time incident management that you're taking all of your digital signals wherever they come from, coming from traditional monitoring tools, coming from, um, could be even tweets, like social data, anything. Um, and you're getting that into one place and you're looking at it and you're making sure that you're making sense of it. So the last thing that you want to do is take a whole bunch of signals that are coming in and then bombard someone with it because that also takes away from their ability to fix a problem. So being able to take in that data, being able to contextualize it, to group it in together into actual problems, um, and then get it to the right person. And so PGD does that. And then, then it's also important then when you get it to the right person, make sure that um, they can look at it, they have all the data that they need so that they can make a really important decision. And that decision is, can I fix it on my own? Is this a big deal? Is this not a big deal? Do I need help? And so if at that point they decide, oh, shoot, like this looks not very good, customers are impacted right now, I need to call on a major incident response, then you want to make it super easy for them to do that, to run a response play, to automate the process of pulling in everything, everyone that they need, because the last thing you want to do is have them look at a phone tree document, um, try to find the person to call, call them, call the next person, do this, you know, 10 times. That wastes a huge amount of time when you're trying to get people all in one place. And so using PagerDuty and Slack to do that is a great way to respond to incidents. Um, and so then when you're responding to incidents, there's a whole bunch of other things you need to do when they're major incidents. You may need to call in more help when you learn something. You may need to add, uh, so add more responders. Um, you know, uh, maybe deliver more context, maybe do some um, diagnostics. There's all sorts of stuff that you can do, and collaborating through those tools to do it is really important. So um, what PagerDuty has done is um, we, we've had for a very long time an integration with Slack, but we are just announcing and releasing our new version of that. So it's in early access right now, and if you'd like to check it out, there's a booth downstairs where we're doing demos. Um, but our philosophy around this next version of it was really thinking about Slack as another user interface for PagerDuty. So that you can, if you are, for instance, at work when something happens, you're probably living or working, maybe not living. You might be living. Maybe living. It's okay. Maybe living. But working in Slack. And so we want to make sure that all the information that, that we're getting to someone can um, be automatically sent to Slack and that all the actions that you may want to take through PagerDuty are accessible to you through Slack. So that's some of what we've done with the um, new integration. So some of the new capabilities are um, cre creating and providing a much richer context for an ongoing incident, sending that into Slack so you can see it. That could include things like um, how many alerts were there or what is the priority of this issue. Um, and so that's a, a screenshot that's showing right now. Um, creating a lot more um, actions that you can take immediately from that dialogue. So if you need to um, go to PagerDuty, if you need to 
um, spin up some more responders, um, you need to ask someone for help, you need um, to reassign it, all those actions are available through the new um, interface. And then some of the other things that you can do is keep track of who's on call or how do I find someone. So instead of having to, again, switch context, if you're working in Slack and you want to just, you know that you need someone from the DB team um, and you don't know who that is, you can just page them from there or you can ask who's on call right now and then page them. So all sorts of new capabilities and more to make sure that um, when you are responding to an incident, you don't have to switch context because anything you have to do that wastes time during incident is a very bad thing. All right, that is amazing. Um, I saw this slide deck and uh, we don't have the new stuff in installed yet and I'm basically just really jealous and I kind of want it right now. So you can have it. I think you're on our like early access list already. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> uh, okay, so really excited about that. Thank you so much. Um, and we're gonna dive into this a little bit later. But first, John Swiney, welcome. Thanks Thank for you. being here. Great we're gonna to turn. Here. Yeah. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit more about yourself and yeah. how you use Slack at T-Mobile. Yeah, uh, so I'm uh, John Sony. I'm a, a technology product manager at T-Mobile, and I've been there for a dozen years and, and had the fortune to work across a whole slew of different apps and services that we use to support our customers. And uh, tell me if this is familiar, but a few years ago, we started trying Slack. We wanted a better way to collaborate, and we started with four to six people. And I think we have over 11,000 uh, T-Mobilers on our Slack instance now. And, and it's been, it's been super great for us to get us all into kind of one, one space and one area. And over the years, I've built um, dozen of, dozens of integrations and apps and worked <clears throat> across that space to um, uh, work better, collaborate better. And what we're here to talk about today is look at how we do some incident management. I've got a couple of examples that I'll share that uh, we can highlight. One is um, pretty kind of foundational, I'd say, and then one is something we're experimenting with. And so the first thing that's foundational, right, is, is hopefully uh, catching and, and alerting for, for incidents, issues in your, in your services, your infrastructure. And we're, we're big fans of really all the tools, but um, what you're seeing up on screen here is an example Grafana alert. And so we have alerts coming from many different systems, right, Grafana, Sentry.io, Splunk, PagerDuty, right, we're well integrated with PagerDuty, so you name it, we probably use it. And for this particular alert, uh, what I want to highlight here is, an, uh, is the context, right? So this is not just a basic alert with one line of text. It's got the, all sorts of rich information about that alert. And so it's got the duration, how long it's been firing for. It's got the threshold. It's got the uh, behavior of the service before the alert, right? The performance leading up to it and, and what it's been doing after it triggered. So um, something where I'm super keen about, and I've been working with my peers to really say, okay, don't just go write that one line alert, uh, you know, build alerts like this. And, and in Grafana's case, uh, it's fairly out of the box and it, it helps you um, put context to your alerts, but, but do this across the board with all the tools that, that, that you're using, right? And, and once you start doing that, your, your engineers, right, have context of what's going on, your stakeholders, anyone can see what's happening right on their mobile device. And from there, we're looking at exploring all sorts of future integrations and, and bots that can fetch additional information, context around those alerts, right? Go, go hit upstream services and see how they're doing. That may be related to that um, particular alert that's firing. Or go look at the underlying infrastructure, right? If you're having problems with that, uh, perhaps that EC2 instance, right? Let's, let's take a look at some of the things that may be adding or, or causing this particular alert. So, so that's some of the things we're doing um, in, in the foundational kind of alerting space. Um, now, we know we'd love to catch things before they turn into larger incidents, but uh, right, the, the things happen. And one of, the, one of the things that we're looking at doing as well, kind of more in the experimental and uh, newer, newer phase of things, is um, uh, post-mortem message capture here. And so that incident is happening, right? And you've got a channel or channels where scores of people are triaging and they're addressing that incident. And Slack is fantastic for bringing everyone together in the same space, um, right? You have a written record of what's gone on. You can see what alerts, what other integrations have fired. And that's, and that's wonderful. But it can be a bit of a fire hose. And so what we're experimenting with is a way to kind of sort through and analyze that information at a later time with a series of custom capture emojis. 
And uh, since we're T-Mobile, they're, they're magenta. And so what you're seeing up on the screen is a series of emojis all, all tailored around um, different kind of categories of capturing information. So you want to flag something, for example, uh, for, for later notation. Uh, perhaps you want to capture that to the incident timeline as kind of this is something officially I want to put on the incident timeline. And so you can tag it with the stopwatch uh, icon there. And, and this can be super helpful once you're, once you're done going through that incident. Um, it, it's a way to pick the noise or the, the signals out of the noise um, that have been happening uh, in that, in that uh, Slack chat room or channel uh, over what could be many, many hours, right? And who really wants to go through that many Slack messages? Um, and once, so once these emojis, right, anyone in the channel can very quickly apply one of these capture emojis and, and then you send it to an online spreadsheet via your, your automation tools, right? So it's, it's very simple. You've got a nice record after and, and that can kind of help start your, um, your, your post-mortem report um, from the information that you've got right in Slack. So that's a couple of brief examples that we've been playing with and, and working with on our, on our journey and our incident management journey. And yeah, love to talk more. All right, thank you. Um, we didn't actually here. Let's. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, we should have practiced this, but we didn't. So apologies. Um, and now comes the hard part. I have questions. Uh. I know they're really challenging. Um, actually, they're not. So uh, we talked a little bit about you know, obviously how you've transformed incident management, but we didn't talk much about what incident management looked like before Slack. So John, um, you definitely have a before Slack and an after Slack in your, your background story. So what did this look like for you? Uh, yeah, before Slack, it was, um, it, it was noisy. It was um, phone bridge or phone bridges uh, in a lot of times. Um, if you've seen that uh, a conference call in a real life video, um, you can imagine that and all the problems that go with, with conference calls, um, noise and, and constant status updates, um, lots of different email threads, and then um, text threads, which if, if you're in a large organization and you're the engineer, and I've, I've been on the receiving end of this, I've been the engineer that's on a text thread with your CIO, um, that's, that's not super fun. So that's, yeah, lots of noise and, and many disparate channels. And Rachel, from your experience, like, is this something that's really common in the like this um, older or non-Slack approach companies? Yeah. Um, yes, we've we've talked to many companies that tend to put literally hundreds of people on a bridge, and um, everyone hates that. And half the people on there aren't paying attention, and it's wasting a bunch of time. And and as John was saying, it's like the constant. Every time someone joins, they ask what's going on, so no one can ever get anything done. So we we kind of highly recommend not to do that. I can see that. <laughs> um, so a follow up to that one. Uh, how are you seeing your customers use Slack for incident management? I know that we have a lot of mutual customers. A lot of them are using our two tools together. Mm -hmm. um, so how are folks using Slack for incident management from where you sit, um, native tools and integrations, and uh, just sort of the landscape from your view? Yeah, so um, I think of it as um, kind of two, two modes of work. So when is your on duty, right? So you may be on call, but you're actually at work. And so you're typically sitting or, you know, you know using Slack. Um, and then the rest of the time, you're not at work, so you're on call. And so when you're on duty, you're probably already in Slack. So really important to get the information about there's an alert, like there's a, there's a notification, send that into Slack, and then um, be able to start working within that interface. Um, what happens when you're on call is that typically you're not in front of a computer um, you want to go live your life. And so there it's really important to have the mobile apps. We have a mobile app where we will um, wake you up if we need to, even though we hate to do that. Um, we'll text you, we'll, um, we'll call you, we'll do all of it. Um, we'll escalate to the next person if we can't get someone. Um, and just getting someone to then be able to look at the issue with on the phone, like wherever you are, be able to assess what's going on, and then even be able to take action from the phone until you get in front of a computer, and then you can actually start to collaborate with people. And so what we see a lot of customers do is, I should say, I did not mean to say that bridges are horrible. It's the hundreds of people on a bridge that is horrible. But what we typically see is that you'll spin up a Slack channel, you'll also have a bridge, 
you'll have someone um, who is the scribe, right? So when you have a major incident, you should always have a scribe who is taking notes on everything that's happening. And that scribe will typically take those notes in the Slack channel. So it's a really great record of what has happened throughout the incident. And John, how does that align with what you're doing at T-Mobile? Yeah, um, and I echo a lot of what you said. Uh, we're, um, uh, although with, at T-Mobile, we tend to use a lot of um, channels that are kind of pre-established and are, are um, either put forward by that, that team or that product or that service. And so um, what we end up doing is we'll, we'll end up using, uh, we'll at someone to bring them into that channel at that time, focus on the issue that we've, we've kind of narrowed down to that service and, and work through it there in a lot of cases. Um, we're, we're not to the point yet for a lot of our incidents where we're actually spinning up specific channels, but we're exploring that. Um, and then in case, uh, in terms of um, hopefully before you even catch that issue, we're using a lot of, a lot of integration. We have hundreds and hundreds of web hooks. Um, we have PagerDuty, Grafana. We have a lot of the kind of out-of-the-box integrations and, and teams um, before those incidents happen are, are being quite good about actually uh, emitting alerts to um, maybe it's their own channel or maybe I've seen a lot of teams actually spin up specific alert channels and then you go into that alert channel and then you, s you, you tell your team members, you say, set the notifications to all the time for this channel. And then as soon as that alert fires, you've got a, a nice push message on your mobile. So we do a lot of that as well. Um, but yeah, a lot of you know, bring folks in on the fly, too. Um, that's, I, so before this, um, John and I were talking about some of the tooling that you use, um, Elasticsearch. Uh, what other tooling do you use to um, make sure that alerts, like you're detecting things early and you're getting stuff, uh, like you're getting notified quickly? Yeah, so we use, um, there's a lot of standard tools we're using out of the box that you can go in, uh, an engineer can go in uh, and set a threshold um, in Grafana uh, with a fairly manual threshold. Um, and, we're, and we're starting to explore uh, machine learning and anomaly detection across our various kind of data stacks. And like you mentioned, Elasticsearch is, is one that um, will set up uh, anomaly detectors and then just pipe those into Slack. And, and that's great because you don't have to go in and set a threshold. Uh, a lot of our workloads tend to be very, um, can be very bursty or they can cycle with, uh, as you imagine, retail reps or care reps are, are using or not using the service um, uh, during the hours of the day. So we'll, we'll use the anomaly detection to, to start hopefully detecting things before they go completely terrible. And you mentioned something about robot phones when we were talking yesterday. <sighs> yes, robot phones. Um, uh, the other thing we're doing, uh, one of my buddies um, has set up, and, and we have uh, an entire lab with racks of physical phones and robots. And uh, those robots are there to really be virtual customers and actually use the, uh, use the phone um, as anyone would use it and use our apps and our services on it. And, uh, and those robots are uh, continually running the phones and when something, when something odd happens there, they'll take a screenshot and a video and drop it right into Slack. So you don't have to, we don't need a web portal to go to to see that information or to see what's going wrong with that app or service. Uh, you've got it right in Slack and you can play the video right from, from your phone as you're watching that service. So that's, that's been something that we've uh, loved about Slack. It's kind of that canvas for some cool robot features. Uh, so, Rachel, given that like super specific um, T-Mobile, obviously, is a lot of different ways to generate alerts and bring them in, um, how do you view PagerDuty in sort of this universe of generating and aggregating and detecting incidents? Yeah, so um, PagerDuty, um, we've spent a lot of time making it super easy to send us data. So we have integrations with 300 different tools um, out of the box. We also have an API. You can send us an email. You can really send us anything. Um, and the reason why we do that is, um, I mentioned a little bit earlier that the last thing you want to have happen when there is a problem is that you bombard the people who are trying to solve the problem with alert after alert after alert. Um, it's one problem, it's not multiple problems. They're all indicators of the same problem. Each of those alerts has important context sometimes, but it doesn't mean that each one should generate a, a ping or a text or a, a phone call because um, that just disrupts someone once they're already starting to work on it. So one of the things we do is we take in all that data and we look at it and we say, oh, these things are related. And we do that not just looking at um, the machine signals that are coming in, but we also look at what has happened in the past and how have people grouped things together or how have people resolved things together. 
And that human action gives us a really big cue as to the fact that these things are related. So if in the past, these 10 things happened and the same person resolved it at the same time two hours later, that's a huge piece of information telling us they're related to each other. Um, so we'll automatically group things together and then um, serve that up as a much more contextual piece of information. And as new information comes in, we just add it in as opposed to pinging and pinging. So um, it occurs to me that what you're talking about there is really lots of individuals acting in different roles within an incident. Um, but obviously, this is how people come together to solve an incident. So how do you view um, PagerDuty's role in bringing these cross-functional teams together as everybody executes their own piece? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we can very easily automate um, is bringing together that group of people. And so if you think about this major incident that may be happening, um, a lot of times um, companies already know who they need to, to be in that um, set of people. So one thing you can do is you can ping and you can add people one by one. But if you know ahead of time when this happens, like when we have a problem with our checkout on our website, we know that we need this set of people. We need an incident commander. We need these five subject matter experts, one from each of the five teams that would be involved. We need a scribe. Um, maybe you need other people as well. You need a customer liaison because this is something that impacts customers. So you need someone who can continue to communicate to stakeholders. Um, you can create something called a, a response play that will automatically spin up all those people with one button press. And so that's another really good way to just cut down on the time it takes to get people together. And then very easily, um, you know, when you notify them all, you're, you're telling them what the select channel is. You're telling them if there's a bridge as well. So you know exactly what to do, where to go. And you're cutting down the time it takes to mobilize people, which could be 15 minutes, 45 minutes, to literally like a minute or two, which is huge when customers are trying to buy things and they can't. Yeah. Um, John, how are you at T-Mobile using Slack to bring together cross-functional teams when something goes down? Yeah, um, and, and I, I love a lot of what you just said. I'm, I'm going to have to go play with PagerDuty now. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, some of the things we're doing that are, are um, uh, I think, probably a little bit similar, um, but, but we do it in a slightly different way, is um, uh, we do have some broadcast channels where when a major incident is happening, we're, we're broadcasting that out to essentially um, anyone who cares and, and is in that channel. And, and, and to this point, there are hundreds of people watching essentially all the incidents that are happening. Um, and then we can, you can essentially give them a place to go when that incident is firing, right? Here's the room or the channel you need to go to um, to, to kind of essentially see what's going on. Um, but I think a lot of it, too, is also like those cross-functional teams, you don't, you don't just bring them together in that. You, you do bring them together in that incident, but you have a history and you have, you have worked with them prior to that. So we've spent a lot of time um, trying to bring together a lot of people um, prior to those incidents, right? And maybe as you roll that product out or, you know, you bring your stakeholders, your, your business folks, your technology teams together. And I'm a big fan of bring them all together and, and you know, teach them all a little bit to speak each other's language. I'm not saying they, you know, a, a marketing person has to be able to interface with a technology person day in and day out. But um, I'm a big fan of, of kind of having open channels, right, and, and being very transparent about that and bringing our folks together, um, hopefully prior to an incident, so that then you've got some context, everybody knows who's who and, and kind of how to work with each other. So you mentioned earlier that you've been the engineer with the CIO on the line asking you <laughs> when it's going to be fixed. Yeah. Um, have you found this to be an effective way to bring in stakeholders to get visibility without interrupting the works? I, it is, yeah. And I, I really like, one of the things I really like about Slack is, um, you know, if, if you really want to, you can pay attention to who's in the channel. But when that, when that incident is happening, um, folks may be um, uh, posting updates into that channel. You may have code snippets. Um, if, if, if a stakeholder, an executive joins that channel, they don't have to say anything. They can just kind of watch and see what's going on. They don't have to ask anything. They don't have to essentially uh, virtually stand over an engineer's shoulder because I've, I've seen that physically and, you know, and, and nobody wants that. And so um, I, I really appreciate that bit of slack where if, if someone really wants to, if a stakeholder wants to go in there, they, they, can, they can watch it. And um, you know, it's, it's, I like to think of it as that channel maybe for that technology team and it's kind of like somebody else's home. You don't go in and, and start breaking the China, right, if, if you're hopefully if you're a stakeholder, but um, they, can, they can watch and they can, and they can be a part of it, which I think is really cool. And Rachel, you're obviously privy to a lot of how this unfolds. So what does PagerDuty recommend in terms of stakeholder engagement and involvement and visibility? Yeah, so um, 
we recommend actually that you do it in a separate channel. <laughs> um, it could be a, a separate communication, it could be a proactive communication, but um, it, it's interesting. We have a great story of when um, our CEO was still somewhat new at the company and she joined a major incident response and we had like all the people who are working on it, they were all in one room, they were on a bridge, they were on a Slack channel, they were working towards something. She came in and she said something like, um, well, I need this done in 10 minutes. And the incident commander said, thank you very much, you can leave now. <laughs> um, that's actually a very important rule of incident command. The incident commander is in charge. The incident commander over outranks the CEO when you have an incident. So she left. And, and the reason why you do that is, is you could see in that incident what happened next. Someone actually wrote in the Slack channel, I feel horrible now, right? Because what just happened is, is she, she said, I want it fixed in 10 minutes. The assumption is that they weren't already trying to fix it as quickly as they possibly could, right? right. And so it made everyone feel horrible, and that's not what you want. So, um, so we actually recommend that you have a process in place and you have a way that you're going to update stakeholders, whatever that way is. Um, and using Slack is a great way to do it. You can also send out proactive text messages, like you can do it in the PagerDuty app. There's all sorts of ways to do it. Probably multiple ways is better because everyone is in a different interface at all points of the day. Um, and proactively notifying them what is going on, who is working on it, um, you know, any information will keep people up to date, will stop them from then wanting to go into, you know, what's happening, asking questions, disrupting people. And so it's, it's an incredibly important thing to do, but it's almost like two parallel um, sets of work that has to happen. Thinking about how you communicate to everyone versus fixing the problem itself. And you don't want to distract from the fixing the problem. Thank you both so much for joining us, for being up here, for telling us your stories, what you've learned. Um, really, really appreciate your time. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so we've heard how two amazing organizations use Slack to improve their incident management process. But we can also draw inspiration from incident management in some other contexts. And a medical emergency is a perfect example. So next up, we have Dan Bruce. He is a paramedic who has brought Slack to the Emergency Medical Services Agency at his alma mater, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in upstate New York. Dan also works as a software reliability engineer at Target, and his engineering background is really well suited to introducing tools and automations to the Slack workspace that's used by RPI Ambulance. So another round of applause. Please welcome Dan to the stage to tell us more. Ooh. Thank you, Allie. You're welcome. Hi, folks. Um, I promise there's only a little tiny bit of audience participation in this. Um, and also, you might have seen us walking around, uh, my best friend Sparky and I. Um, we are not medical staff today. Um, there are other medical staff downstairs, but we're developers. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really happy to be up here and kind of share with you how we use Slack in EMS and, and our agency specifically. So if you've ever done uh, any work in the medical field or the healthcare industry, um, I'm sure you'd probably agree that some areas are really sorely lacking in technology. Um, I've been at EMS about five years now, um, but unlike a lot of my fellow EMTs and paramedics, um, I have a background in tech. And really, since I've gotten into the field, I've thought, well, why not combine the two? So luckily, as Ali said, my alma mater has an ambulance squad, um, and we're a technological university. So it's really the perfect test bed for doing that incorporation of tech into EMS. So as Ali touched on again, um, RPI Ambulance is a collegiate ambulance squad uh, on the campus of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and that's uh, just across the river from the capital of New York, Albany, or in Troy. Um, relatively speaking, we're one of the few uh, EMS agencies, collegiate EMS agencies, in the country that actually transports patients to hospitals. So a lot of other ones do events only on their campus, or maybe they're just first responders and they turn it over to the local ambulance squad or fire department. Um, we're staffed between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. every night, and that's when we have a set crew ready to go on calls. So we know who's going to go. Uh, there's really no, there's, there's no question about that. Uh, but between the daytime hours of 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., we're only on call. 
Um, so a, a real quick show of hands is this is that audience participation part. Um, when you call 911 for a medical emergency, you expect an ambulance to show up. Yeah, right? Yeah, me too. So, so I got to tell you something. Our equipment isn't infallible. Um, so because we're based on this, this hilly college campus, um, we're attending class in, in steel and concrete buildings, and we're often in spaces that we need to maintain a lower volume level, um, our traditional pagers that we would wear on our hip didn't exactly fit our use case perfectly. Uh, bec between the lack of RF signal uh, and the simple problem of having loud, annoying devices in the middle of a college class, we really needed something else. Um, we had had some workarounds for a while, uh, but nothing really worked great. Uh, they were really sort of band-aid solutions uh, instead of actual true supplemental technologies. So to fix the problem, naturally, our hope was to get something cell phone based. You know, we're college kids. We always are on our phones on Reddit or whatever, um, instead of paying attention to our professors. Um, and because they're constantly connected to Wi-Fi, that signal really wouldn't be a problem, like that RF propagation I was talking about earlier. Um, we'd already gotten text messages from our county dispatch center. That's one of those workarounds I mentioned. Um, but they were often delayed. They could be delayed by 30 seconds. Uh, usually, that's the minimum amount of delay. Um, we once had a text come in eight minutes after we were on scene. We were already talking to the patient and doing our assessment. Um, so that, that was unacceptable. You know, we, we had the backup. We had a little bit of information just in case, but it, it really wasn't correct. So eventually, we turned to Slack. Um, that's why we're speaking here. Um, after a few years of using another popular uh, group messaging application for some, you know, our, our main communications platform, we did do the switch to Slack. We got our buy-in from our members. Um, and very shortly thereafter, within a week or two, we started creating some integrations. Um, and the first one that we created is what we called Am I Responding, or AIR. Now, AIR isn't very complex. Um, it has two main components, plus Slack. The first component is a microcomputer. It's constantly listening to our dispatch and uh, our fire and EMS radio frequency. Um, it's listening for these things that we call tones, which are synthesized as a pair of audible frequencies um, that kind of sound like a hmm, something like that. Um, those, those tones are actually unique to a department or an agency uh, within any particular county dispatch center. Um, so as soon as RPI Ambulance's tones play over that dispatch channel, um, the computer immediately sends a notification to an integration server that we have set up. And it also begins recording that dispatch audio. So that integration server, it takes that dispatch notification, and it drops a message in our responding channel on Slack. And that's followed pretty shortly thereafter by the, the dispatch audio itself. Now, as I said before, we're not staffed during the day, and because we don't have a set job, we don't have a set career, you know, nine, nine to five like you folks do, um, and because our classes change on a daily basis, we, we really almost never know who's around to actually go on that call. Um, additionally, we have legal requirements from the uh, New York State Department of Health. We are required to have one EMT and one driver on every call at a minimum. Um, but again, we don't really have any way of knowing, you know, the level of credentialing we have or the who, who is going to the call before we get to the ambulance garage. So that message that's dropped into the dispatch channel, it has these two options, yes or no, to, so members can very easily and quickly hit if they're going to the call or not. And as you can see, that's a little bit of an example of what it would look like. So as I said, immediately, and, and immediately, I can't stress that enough, within a, a second and a half, quite literally, after that dispatch begins, before the dispatcher even starts talking over the radio, uh, we have a notification in our channel. This helps members you know, going to that ambulance garage with knowing who else is going on the call. And based on our internal you know, knowledge of, uh, of our membership and who responds to, the, you know, as you saw in the previous slide, we know if we have that full crew or not. And like I said, about 30 seconds afterwards, we have uh, a dispatch that drops in the channel. Um, I am going to play that uh, dispatch right now, just so you have a little sense of what that sounds like. Um, there's a lot of information in there that's very useful to us, but might just kind of sound like static to you. Um, this is kind of what it sounds like. Southeast Metro Breathing Props, Crockett Hall, 1999 Burnett Avenue, which is named Avenue P4, RPI Ambulance, Detroit Fire, Delta MS Breathing Props, 1999 Burnett Avenue, Crockett Stage Avenue, 157 So that's a dispatch. Tons of information in, I don't know, 15 seconds. But, you know, we're going to the call. We're, we're going up to the ambulance garage. We might be in our fly car, which is like an SUV with a bunch of medical equipment, to get the, the ambulance so we can actually transport the patient. And all this is going on in the background, and we're getting calls and texts to try to figure out who's going on the call. We're going to miss some of that info. So what we do is we post it in the channel. So we can really quick, two taps, bring it up, listen to that dispatch audio again, and know the room number, what, you know, how old the patient is, what we might be dealing with, the address, things like that. 
So we have a couple plans for the future of Air as well, um, using some other integrations that we've built uh, that incorporate our membership data into Slack. Uh, we'd like to have Air automatically provide a notification when that required level of staffing is met, that one EMT and one driver, because we do have that information in a digital format already. Another thing we plan to fix is the code itself. Uh, Air was built before us college kids knew ES6 notation and uh, continuous integration, deployments, and stuff like that, you know, testing. So when we're out of service in the summer months, uh, coming up a couple weeks from now, actually, we do plan to dismantle pretty much all of our integrations and rebuild them from the ground up to maintain a little bit cleaner level of code. So all in all, Slack has proven to be a really, really, really solid platform for our use case. Um, you know, we're in a field that seconds count, uh, quite literally. That could be the, could be the matter of life and death. Um, and we've shown that that instant notification of emergency calls uh, on a variety of devices, your laptops, your browser, your phone, whatever, um, that's really helped our, our membership respond to incidents. Thank you. So um, on behalf of everyone at Slack, we are deeply grateful to be of service to you. Thank you so much for all you do. Thank you um, very much for your platform. Thanks for coming today. This is great. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We've covered a lot today. But guess what? There's a whole bunch you can take away and do tomorrow when uh, two days when you're back in the office. Because you're here tomorrow, right? Everybody's coming back. This is pretty good. All right. So um, some key takeaways for you. Uh, provide some key context to incoming alerts by connecting apps to Slack, such as PagerDuty, which we heard about, and all your other custom, such, custom stuff, which we heard about from John. Um, you can create focus channels for incidents. As we heard about from John, they have a channel where it all lives. Um, Rachel talked about having different channels for different incidents. Assemble the right people, assign roles, use checklists, follow a dedicated procedure. And finally, by using dedicated channels when an incident happens, you will be able to use that conversation later to analyze what happened and inform your postmortems. And that's it. So thank you. And next up, you're going to join us at 420, where you started today for the closing keynote. Thank you.